The Essence of Prayer by Ian Bounds, Chapter 8, being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. Prayer and Consecration. When we study the many-sidedness of prayer, we are surprised at the number of things with which it is connected. There is no phrase of the human life which it does not affect, and it has to do with everything affecting human salvation. Prayer and consecration are closely related. Prayer leads up to and governs consecration. Prayer is precedent to consecration, accompanies it, and is a direct result of it. Much goes under the name of consecration, which has no consecration in it. Much consecration at the present day is defective, superficial, and sparse, worth nothing so far as the office and ends of consecrations are concerned. Popular consecration is sadly at fault because it has little or no prayer in it. No consecration is worth a thought which is not the direct fruit of much praying and which fails to bring one into a life of prayer. Prayer is the one thing prominent in a consecrated life. Consecration is much more than a life of so-called service. It is the divine, the one divine standard of experience, of living, and of service. It is the one thing at which the believer should aim. Nothing short of entire consecration must satisfy him. Never is he to be contented till he is fully, entirely the Lord's, by his own consent. His praying naturally and voluntarily leads up to this one act of his. Consecration is the voluntary set dedication of oneself to God, an offering definitely made and made without any reservation whatever. It is the setting apart of all we are, all we have, and all we expect to have to be to God first of all. It is not so much the giving of ourselves to the church or their mere engaging in some one line of church work. Almighty God is in view, and he is the end of all consecration. It is a separation of one's self to God, a development uh, to, of all that he is and has to a sacred use. Some things may be devoted to a special purpose, but it is not consecration in the true sense. Consecration has a sacred nature. It is devoted to holy ends. It is the voluntary putting of one's self in God's hands to be used sacredly, holy, with sanctifying ends in view. Consecration is not so much the setting oneself apart from sinful things and wicked ends, but rather it is the separation from worldly, secular, and even legitimate things if they come in contact with God's plans to holy uses. It is the devoiding of all we have to God for his own specific use. It is a separation from things questionable or even legitimate when the choice is to be made between the things of this life and claims of God. The consecration which meets God's demands and which he accepts is to be full, complete, with no mental reservation, with nothing withheld. It cannot be partial any more than a whole burnt offering in Old Testament times could have been partial. The whole animal had to be sacrificed and offered. To preserve any part of the animal would have seriously violated the offering. So to make a half-hearted partial consecration is to make no consecration at all, and is to fail utterly in securing the divine acceptance. It involves our whole being, all we have and all that we are. Everything is definitely and voluntarily placed in God's hands for the supreme use. Consecration is not at all is not all there it is in holiness. Consecration is not all there is in holiness. Many make serious mistakes at this point. Consecration makes us relatively holy. We are holy only in the sense that we are now closely related to God, in which we were not related there hither heretofore. Consecration is the human side of holiness. In this sense, it is self-sanctification, and only in this sense. Sanctification or holiness in its truest and highest sense is divine. 
the act of the Holy Spirit working in the heart, making it clean, and putting therein, in a higher degree, the fruits of the Spirit. This distinction is clearly set forth and kept in view by Moses in Leviticus, wherein he shows the human and the divine side of sanctification or holiness. Sanctify yourself, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Here we are to sanctify ourselves, and then in the next word we are taught that it is the Lord which sanctifies us. God does not sanctify us to his service. We do not sanctify ourselves in this highest sense. Here is the twofold meaning of sanctification and a distinction which needs to be always kept in mind. Consecration being the intelligent, voluntary act of the believer. This act is the direct result of praying. No prayerless man can ever conceive the idea of a full consecration. Prayerlessness and consecration have nothing whatever in common. A life of prayer naturally leads up to a full consecration. It leads nowhere else. In fact, a life of prayer is satisfied with nothing else but an entire dedication of oneself to God. Consecration recognizes fully God's ownership of us. It cheerfully assents to the truth set forth by God. You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. The true praying leads that way. It cannot reach any other destination. It is bound to run into this depot. That is its natural results. This is the sort of work which praying turns out. Praying makes consecrated people. It cannot make any other sort. It drives to this end. It aims at this very purpose. As prayer leads up to and brings forth full consecration, so prayer entirely impregnates a consecrated life. The prayer life and the consecrated life are intimate companions. They are Siamese twins, inseparable. Prayer enters into every phase of a consecrated life. A prayerless life which claims consecration is a misnomer. False, counterfeit. Consecration is really the setting apart of oneself to a life of prayer. It means not only to pray, but to pray habitually, and to pray more effectually. It is the consecrated man who accomplishes most by his praying. God must hear the man wholly given up to God. God cannot de deny the request of him who has renounced all claims to himself, and who has wholly dedicated himself to God and his service. This act of the consecrated man puts him, quote, on praying ground and pleading terms, unquote, with God. It puts him in reach of God in prayer. It places him where he can get a hold of God and where he can influence God to do things which he would not otherwise do. Consecration brings answers to prayer. God can depend upon consecrated men. God can afford to commit himself in prayer to those who have fully committed themselves to God. He who gives all to God will get all from God. Having given all to God, he can claim all that God has for him. As prayer is the condition of full consecration, so prayer is the habit, the rule, of him who has dedicated himself wholly to God. Prayer is becoming in the consecrated life. Prayer is no strange thing in such a life. There is a particular affinity between prayer and consecration, for both recognize God, both submit to God, and both have their aim and end in God. Prayer is part and parcel of the consecrated life. Prayer is the constant, the inseparable, the intimate companion of consecration. They walk and talk together. There is much talk today of consecration, and many are termed consecrated people who know not the alphabet of it. Much modern consecration falls far below the scriptural standard. There is really no consecration in it, just as there is much praying without any real prayer in it. So there is much so-called consecration current today in the church which has no real consecration in it. Much passes for consecration in the church, which receives the praise and plaudits of superficial formal professors, but which is wide of the mark. There is much hurrying to and fro, here and there, much fuss and feathers, 
much going about and doing many things, and those who busy themselves after this fashion are called consecrated men and women. The central trouble with all this false consecration is that there is no prayer in it, nor is it in any sense the direct result of praying. People can do many excellent and commendable things in the church and be utter strangers to a life of consecration just as they can do many things and be prayerless. Here is the true test of consecration. It is a life of prayer. Useless prayer is preeminent. Useless prayer is in the front. The consecration is faulty, deceptive, falsely named. Does he pray? That is the test. The question of every so-called consecrated man. Is he a man of prayer? No consecration is worth a thought if it is devoid of prayer. Yea, more if it is not preeminently and primarily a life of prayer. God wants consecrated men because they can pray and will pray. He can use consecrated men because they can use, because he can use praying men. He can use consecrated men because he can use praying men. As prayerless men are in his way, hinder him, and prevent the success of his cause, so likewise unconsecrated men are useless to him and hinder him in carrying out his gracious plans, and in executing his noble purposes and redemption. God wants consecrated men, because he wants praying men. Consecration and prayer meet in the same man. Prayer is the tool with which the consecrated man works. Consecrated men are the agents through which prayer works. Prayer helps the consecrated man in maintaining his attitude of consecration, keeps him alive to God, and aims him in doing the work to which he is called, and to which he has given himself. Consecration helps to effectual praying. Consecration enables one to get the most out of his praying. Let him to whom we now belong, his sovereign right assert, and take up every thankful song and every loving heart. He justly claims us for his own, who brought us for the price. The Christian lives to Christ alone. To Christ alone he dies. We must insist upon it that the prime purpose of consecration is not service in the ordinary sense of that word. Service in the minds of not a few means nothing more than engaging in some of the many forms of modern church activities. There are a multitude of such activities, enough to engage the time and mind of any one, yea, even more than enough. Some of these may be good, others not so good. The present day church is filled with machinery, organizations, committees, and societies, so much so that the power it has is altogether insufficient to run the machinery or to furnish life sufficient to do all this external work. Consecration has a much higher and nobler end than merely to expend itself in these external things. Consecration aims at the right sort of service, the scriptural kind. It seeks to serve God, but in an entirely a different sphere than that which is in the minds of present-day church leaders and workers. The very first sort of service mentioned in Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, is this wonderful prophecy and statement in Luke chapter 1, verse 74, was thus, quote, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, all the days of our life, unquote. Here we have the idea of, quote, serving God in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life, unquote. And the same kind of service is mentioned in Luke's strong tribute to the father and mother of John the Baptist before the latter's birth. Quote, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the law of, of the Lord, blameless. Unquote. And Paul in writing to the Philippians, strikes the same keynote in putting the emphasis on blamelessness of life. Quote, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Unquote. We must mention a truth which is strangely overlooked in these days by what are called personal workers, that in the epistles of Paul and others, it is not what are called church activities which are brought to the front, but rather the personal life. It is good behavior, righteous conduct, holy living, 
godly conversation, right tempers, things which belong primarily to the personal life in religion. Everywhere there is emphasized, put in the forefront, made much of and insisted on. Religion, first of all, puts one to living right. Religion shows itself in the life. Thus is religion to prove its reality, its sincerity, and its divinity. So let our lips and lives express the holy gospel we profess. To let our works and virtues shine, to prove the doctrine all divine. Thus shall we proclaim, thus proclaim abroad the honors of our Savior God, when this salvation reigns within, and grace subdues the powers of sin. The first great end of consecration is holiness of heart and of life. It is to glorify God, and this can be done in no more effectual way than by a holy life flowing from a heart cleansed from all sin. The great burden of heart pressed on every one who becomes a Christian lies right here. This he is to ever keep in mind, and to further this kind of life and this kind of heart, he is to watch, to pray, and to blend all, bend all his diligence in using all the means of grace. He who is truly and fully consecrated lives a holy life. He seeks after holiness of heart, is not satisfied without it. For this very purpose, he consecrates himself to God. He gives himself entirely over to God in order to be holy in heart and in life. As holiness of heart and of life is thoroughly impregnated with prayer, so consecration and prayer are closely allied and personal religion. It takes prayer to bring one into such a consecrated life of holiness to the Lord, and it takes prayer to maintain such a life. Without much prayer, such a life of holiness will break down. Holy people are praying people. Holiness of heart and life puts people to praying. Consecration puts people to praying in earnest. Prayerless people are strangers to anything like holiness of heart and cleanliness of heart. Those who are, to, are unfamiliar with the closet are not at all interested in consecration and holiness. Holiness thrives in the place of secret prayer. The environments of the closet of prayer are favorable to its being and its culture. In the closet, holiness is found. Consecration brings one into holiness of heart, and prayer stands hard by when it is done. The spirit of consecration is the spirit of prayer. The law of consecration is the law of prayer. Both laws work in perfect harmony without the slightest jar or discord. Consecration is the practical expression of true prayer. People who are consecrated are known by their praying habits. Consecration thus expresses itself in prayer. He who is not interested in prayer has no interest in consecration. Prayer creates an interest in consecration. Then prayer brings one into a state of heart, which consecration is a subject of delight, bringing joy of heart, satisfaction of soul, contented of spirit. The consecrated soul is the happiest soul. There is no friction whatever between him who is fully given over to God and God's will. There is perfect harmony between the will of such a man and God and his will. And the two wills being in perfect accord, this brings rest of soul, absence of friction, and the presence of perfect peace. Lord, in the strength of grace, with a glad heart and free, myself, my residue of days, I consecrate to thee. Thy ransom servant, I restore to thee thy own, and from this moment, live or die, to serve my God alone.